picked the wrong one again. <laughs> <laughs> but we're there now. So, uh, I realized something based off of the very few comments that we've received so far in between these uh, last few episodes. And that is, uh, some people are having a hard time relating what we're showing in the graph to what's happening with the rocket. And so what I, this is one of the things I had wanted to do from the very beginning is do an overlay of the data as the thing flies. So it's very straightforward. So we'll come in here and this is a, a video of a flight. Sound on. So real quick, what you have here is sort of a 50% shaded overlay of a chart, right? Can you see that? Yeah. And then up in the top it says noise equals zero. And yeah. there's a line through it right now because that's the actual altitude of almost seven meters. This is six, almost seven meters. So, yeah. um, and it's an orange or brown line yeah. because both the AGL and the noisy AGL are the same value. And yellow and red makes brown, apparently. Right. <laughs> so there are two lines right on top of each other and they mixed into a brown color. Uh, now this line is going to drop very quickly once we take off. Obviously, we're going to take off, and then the thrust will uh, take up a lot more space in the scale, and it'll all auto-scale for us. Let's uh, give it a shot here. There we go. There's our thrust vector, our thrust curve, rather. We fired full thrust. We're getting a little bit more thrust as we go up. Here's our altitude and our noisy altitude rising. Right. We're up going up 3,000, going up to 4,000. Now, I say near real time because this is updating once a second. And so a lot of the detail comes in in little chunks. Yeah. Right, because this is putting out about 10 samples a second. So we're up, we're almost at altitude. There we go. Our thrust comes back on. Um. Yeah. That gets us up to 5,000, then we give it a little extra thrust as we start to land on 5,000, and then notice how our thrust just kind of, just a little bitty, gets smaller and smaller error, and these this reduction in the error is what the PID function is giving us. It's giving us the mathematics, the mathematical adjustments necessary to get to a point where we're putting out just exactly the amount of fuel we need to stay at altitude. So this is, again, noise equals zero. So this is with all the beautiful, perfect signals of a simulation, right? Yeah. And then we're going to cruise here until we get to 10%, and then our thrust, uh, right here, there it goes, our thrust went to zero, and we begin to fall out of the sky as our top notch, right? So this is our lovely little smooth elephant picture that we finally got to right. after a few uh, tries at adjusting the PID values. And then here as we come down to around, uh, watch here for around 700, you'll actually see the thrust and the altitude cross. See how they came up and crossed yeah. each other? And then we get this nice readjustment of the thrust in order to gently come down on the final target altitude, which is zero, right? Yeah. Nice, gentle flight, all sorts of smoothness, right? This is with nice, clean, perfect data. <laughs> and we land, right? Yeah. So, what we really wanted to show last time was what happens when you get noise in the data and show that noise. And so that's much... Uh, uh, much more easily done after the fact. Here's the next video. All right, so now we're at, we haven't taken off yet. We're still in the countdown, right? And we have two values, the AGL in the red line, which is nice and perfect, right? That's our simulate in, uh, simulated value from the sim and, or the game. And then the green value is our noisy altitude. And the reason it's very square is that the samples are only once every ten sec a tenth of a second. Uh, so we've, we're looking at fairly few samples. Actually, it looks like it's... Uh, that should have been 20 to 40 samples. So that would have been a 
about a fifth of a second between the 20 and the 40 is what it should be doing. It may not be doing exactly that, but in any case. So we'll let this guy take off, and you'll notice the noise equals 1, which means we're, um, we're uh, adding plus or minus 1 meter to our actual altitude, and then using the noisy altitude to adjust our throttle. So it doesn't really affect takeoff. It ends up being roughly the same curve. Nice and gentle. And you can see how the two lines are somewhat separate here. A little hard to see, but we'll get into being able to actually zoom in in a rational, simple way, unlike what we were trying to do with open, uh, open office and calc. So we come up, get up to uh, 5,000 or close, we're coasting up. Now we've in, uh, turned on the PID. We get our first nice little thrust here to get to our final at 5,000. Then we cut off and then we do some sort of extra, you know, accelerated thrust. And our thrust for level gets very wobbly. Oof. And so we're burning up a whole lot of extra fuel, blowing past our target altitude and then landing on it and then blowing past again and then falling below it and then going up again. And you can also tell to some degree the waviness of this versus the previous flight, right? So that's how your PID controller goes, you know, is useful. But if your data is wobbly, your PID controller can only work so well, <laughs> right? And that was the primary point I was trying to get across uh, in last time's view. Oh, here we go. We're dropping out of the sky. Ah! Back in its own... Back in its plume. <laughs> so again, we'll get down to about 700 or so, and then we'll start firing. But as we get closer and closer to the ground, that one meter is going to be more and more important. As you can imagine, <laughs> that one meter of, meter of random difference is going to be all the difference between success and failure. <laughs> Here we go. Got our initial thrust. And also you can tell we were going to use up a whole lot more thrust and fuel trying to land. And then we're going to do the one thing we were always warned not to do manually, and that is stall. Whoopsie. Oh. Schmack. <laughs> oh well. That's not good. You don't even hear that. Oh well. <laughs> well, that's funny. So that is why you want to filter <laughs> out your bad data, <laughs> so you don't end up with this situation. That's funny. At least he didn't explode. <laughs> All right, puppy, go on. So, uh, this is, I think, gets the point across a lot better, a lot more dramatically. <laughs> All right, then. So, now that I did the, uh, the big dramatic entrance, I want to talk about where this all came from, and we'll get into maybe I can show you how this kind of works. I won't go through every last detail, the views, uh, product, it apparently pronounced views, views. Uh, is a scientific data visualization product, it's fancy words for graphs. Oh, that's what, you, that's what I couldn't figure out earlier. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but it can do all sorts of, ex uh, you know, complicated graphs. We're really, really barely using the tool set. Uh, but this is an open source tool set. I, last time I talked about MATLAB, turns out uh, the personal license is not all that bad. 150 bucks last I checked. I think that's yearly. Not any worse than a Netflix subscription, I suppose. <laughs> if you're really addicted to your data. Um, and the actual product that I was looking for is actually inside the MATLAB tools called Simulink. And that's what links up the simulations to your data visualization so that you can do this same kind of thing, but with real hardware. And uh, for example of doing this kind of thing with real hardware, we have Mr. BPS Space, Joe Barnard. Wow. So this channel I would highly recommend. I was 
This is uh, his data visualization for his model rocket here. Uh, this is all done in processing, which I've used before. Uh, and I hope I can find, he'll either provide the source or I might make something similar. It's got a bunch of state information here in the ready for launch part, uh, which would be I custom. But you've got vertical velocity and altitude and the vertical position. And what this rocket is, is a v thrust vector controlled solid rocket motor. So it's very much like the uh, thrust controlled of uh, the game. So here's, here's his latest launch of the Sprint project. Four, three, two, go sprint, go able. Good luck, man. There it is, holding. Oh, it's a little wobbly. That's it. I did it. <laughs> the straight Stupid up. GNS. And they're like everybody else. Parachute, 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 parachute. Oh, there he goes. On, Yay, oh, parachute. Hey, that was a really good flight. Third, third flight. He's got. I got hundreds of flights <laughs> in the sim, but you can see, of course, his are much more expensive. Yeah. But this next view coming up is an actual view down the rocket nozzle, and you can see it making its adjustments to stay stable. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> aye, 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 aye. <laughs> <laughs> so. Partly this is his latest video from today, um, cool. uh, but the other reason I had this in here was he was talking about how he managed to improve that thrust vector control algorithm so that he would stay over the launch pad area so that when he, he wouldn't fly too far away. All right. So I believe it starts roughly here. He does this thing with uh, Photoshop. And then oh, echoes yeah. the image as the vehicle Stitching. goes down range. Yeah, echoes the image. I haven't seen that. Velocity. When you overlay those echoed images, you can actually see how the correction works. We have liftoff, a little bit of pitch over because of misalignment. Then at T yeah. plus one second right. the flight, yeah. we begin position cool. control and bring the vehicle back above the pad. The thing that made this flight so successful, Here comes. the difference between this and flight six and seven, is I implemented a Kalman filter that I wrote for- Mr. Kalman filter. Accelerations <laughs> on the vehicle. So when the GNSS radio, when the GPS, GPS. is slow or it's a little laggy, the accelerations can fill in those gaps and make sure that we have a really good real-time estimate of our position and our velocity on the vehicle. Now we. So that was what I was trying to explain in the last video, <laughs> was that when you have one input sensor, in this case is GPS, telling them where he is, um, but you have inertial sensors that tell you how much you've been pushed to one side or the other, right. then you can use the, diff the, the secondary input to correct the primary input and say, I'm... You know, I, my GPS is anywhere in this circle, right? Plus or minus some distance is my GPS signal. But I started, I baselined everything right before I took off, right? So I, I know where I started. I know I've only moved this much to the left, and that should only be about a meter. And therefore, I can adjust, use that as part of the Kalman filter to readjust my known position from the GPS. Also because the GPS is slow to update. So... Uh, I thought it was kind of interesting that he was using a Kalman filter as well. Uh, and then he also got a hold of this product called Curve. And here with the flight data, um, it's a great data visualization. And I could not find a copy of this. Grafana, but <laughs> I found CSV Grafana. Into it and then just get dump a CSV and you get immediate on, plots. Right? That's so what I'm looking for, right? <laughs> so this is just about. So this is all the various things he's actually collecting. Uh, so. If you liked uh, all our stuff that we were doing with data things. analysis and so uh, forth, and you want to see it done LA with, that does get um, yeah, he's, he, he apparently is embarrassed of one of his data outputs. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone's embarrassed of one data output or another, I guess. <laughs> but in any case. Uh, and then he also gets into this bit right here, I think is a little funny. He's doing all sorts of data analysis. And then he gets in, it's right about here. To use them Oof. for a long time, they're going to drift, you're going to get a lot so of error. This is his altitude so raw data of the two, both two of inputs. Sensors. Now, let's look at the top of this uh, Here section of plot. And I know what you're thinking, I know you know what's coming. Let's just say it at the same time. We're going to look at the process estimate. 
process estimate covariance. Of course, yes, process estimate covariance. Which is to say, which is to say, and I'll shorten it right here because I don't want to use too much of his stuff here. Um, but uh, what it what is to say that these are the values of those adjustments that are being made inside the Kalman filter. You know the calculations of different differential values from different inputs, and then using those, combining those to find that final output. These are those various uh, numbers, and these uh, each peak here is a, um, a how much it is confident that its reading is correct. And down at the bottom line is 100% confident because each one of these 100% confidence is a reading from the GPS, telling you exactly where you are. And then in this interim time between the one or two second interval of the uh, GPS reading, the inertial sensor is being used and it, it's drifting. It's not terribly accurate and because it's inexpensive um, and small. And he, uh, which is what he could afford on that board, he actually, an electrical engineer, designed that whole avionics control board. It's um, quite a complex project. Uh, in fact, let's see. I believe I still have his uh, his page up here. Quite. There we go. So this is his channel, BPS dot space, and it's uh, Joe Barnard Joe Barnard's propulsion systems. And then he says he's not a propulsion engineer, but he's an electrical engineer <laughs> and an avionics engineer of some. Uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, at what level, but he does all this in the real world. This is his thrust vector control attempts. Uh, fairing tests. Uh, where was this? Let's get back up here. His uh, Echo. So Echo was a, an attempt to land a model rocket like Musk's lands rockets, right? Except you've only got so much fuel and you have to fire the rocket right at the exact same time and there's all sorts of problems doing it. So uh, it was quite adventurous. Uh, he gave up on that and he's using this little guy here. Hi everyone, my name is so, Joe Barnard. You'll have to forgive the words. Here's the actual spacecraft. Position. Right. So, uh, what this is, is an attempt to do that same kind of vertical lift testing and, and test all the the settings out that you would use for a rocket, but with something that has a, a continuous thrust or a much longer thrust. So this is a battery-powered ducted fan. Wow. This is another version of the flying bedstead, essentially. <laughs> it's just the modern version of the flying bedstead. Did you make something like this before? Uh, I tried, but not so much. <laughs> I didn't have the electronic control circuitry to maintain it. But you notice this is where he also set up all this uh, sprite ground control. All the raw data is here, and then the graphs are along here. Which is great for seeing as it goes, right? But really, after the fact, he uses that other data uh, visualization tool for actual analysis. So, having shown all that, let us get to the game. And let's uh, readjust our uh, settings, and I'll show you how this captures. And uh, we'll have one more flight where we have, uh, you know, we had zero the first flight, one on all stages of the second flight. And in reality, we're going to have, you know, different amounts of accuracy at different stages, correct? Uh -huh. um, so the launch stage is going to be zero because it actually doesn't matter. Uh, the hover stage, we're going to put that back to about the 0.6 range, which is uh, our 0.3 range, which is one foot, uh, plus or minus. Good, better, a little bit better than one meter, which is about three feet. So um, what we'll do is, and then on, on descent, what I, we missed last time was putting in a uh, uncertainty multiplier based off of the throttle. So that as we throttle up, we create more interference and noise uh, with our altitude sensor, and we get a noisier altitude sensor when we're at higher thrust. The idea behind that being, you know, vibration and exhaust flumes when we're the exhaust plumes when we're near the surface, and possibly, you know, ejecta from the surface that we're landing on, that kind of thing. So let's get the uh, game sound back on and get into the editor get back to my usual size <laughs> 
So all of this is being done inside the orange black box. And let's see. I need to keep my mouse in the right place. All right, so on launch, our th noise is going to be zero since we're not actually using it to determine when we're going to stop our uh, thrust. When we're here, one, which, well, let's make it something different since we already saw one. Let's see two while we hover. So this should be a much shorter hover <laughs> because we're going to burn a lot more fuel trying, you know, with this much extra noise in the, uh, in the altitude. And then down here, instead of the one, this is where we had the pinned out. So we're going to add noise based off of the throttle and based off of one times the throttle. Um, so, which is going to be somewhere between plus or minus one. So, uh, but it's going to be plus or minus one based off of how much thrust we're using rather than just some random amount, right? Um, actually, it's a combination of a random amount and <laughs> it's a, uh, actually, it's a random amount scaled by how much throttle we use up to one. So I guess that ends up being plus or minus one. <laughs> So let's make this something more interesting. Let's make it, uh, oh, um, I think we can land with a little bit worse. Let's make it uh, up to two, perhaps, but not quite a whole yard like we were before. Actually, I got about 0. 0.6 is two feet. So that'll give us about a two foot variance depending on our throttle my, uh, and also depending on a random amount. So we get all sorts of noise, but it's also addition, you know, um, uh, tied to our throttle, and that's on the the descent only. So that's pretty much that for our changes. We'll save. I have had the game crash on me a couple of times today, so oh, I'm saving the craft every time I go out. <laughs> so uh, we still have the same data logger in place. And let's just pause for a moment, and I'll bring open the Views tool. So here's the actual graphing tool. And it's uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, I think if you, you know, go spend an hour or so, half hour in the tutorials, you can set up your own graph like this. Um, each thing is based off of a different widget. So there's a page, there's a grid, inside the grid there's a graph. Um, there's an X, axis, X and Y axis on that graph, and then there's various data values that you've plotted. So in this case, we're going to do the data values out of the AGL and the sample, which all come from this flight log file, right? So now what we want to do is we want to change this flight log file to the one that was just created just as we started our countdown. And since we already have everything set up, we can just go to Import, Browse, grab the latest flight log, and then you can see it already shows you a, an, a pro, you know the contents of the file. Here's the, the notes. Sample number, which I had to add in to make things a little more straightforward here. And so this is just the sample number. It's a number just increments every time, uh, roughly one per, you know, 10 per second. And then our nose, noisy, our AGL and our thrust, right? So it just, it pretty much figured this out all, its, all on its own because it's a comma separated file, right? And the only thing I had to do was tell it to ignore that top row where the notes were. Um, and we don't want the prefix. So we go ahead and do the import. It says these are the different fields, a one-dimensional with 18 values of these various funds. We go close. And there's our chart so far, right? No, no Z AGL, and uh, we had zero at this stage. So it's again, it's the brown line. Um, some of the things are manually changed, like uh, you have your various values, and then you have your key. So this is noise varies. Noise equals varies. I guess I should say it's noise equals 
zero, uh, zero, comma, what did we give it? Two on the hover and two T for thrust. Anyway, you can pretty much put whatever you want to in there <laughs> for the label. Um, so that gets everything set up again. You know, we're just now started, so we're only at six or seven meters. Um, and then once you have that set up, you say, I want to reload this file if it changes every second. And then you just close that, and it's now reloading. Now what I've done over on the uh, game view, which is over here. There we go. Had a little problem with the OBS Studio. <laughs> So what I'm basically doing in OBS is I'm taking the views window and cropping it to just the chart area and then overlaying it on the video um, as another input. And so as we start the game again, we should start seeing there our data is updating live. And here we go, there's the thrust. Here we get our... Ooh, that's very noisy data. Ooh. You can actually see it in this right. zoomed out position. <laughs> so we're cruising on up. And as we get to our 5,000 uh, meter target and go into hover mode, We'll start seeing probably a very, very noisy uh, thrust output. Not because the yeah there see we over we over thrust. Yeah. Now we're gonna come back down, and we're kind of wobbling down here at the bottom, just wibble wobble wobble. <laughs> and we got a little bit of a sad elephant going here. Yeah. <laughs> got a bit of a hump. <laughs> And then as you can see, we have these periods of of sudden acceleration because the the randomness is throwing off the PID algorithm. It's causing the PID, PID algorithm to, to go off into the weeds, and then eventually it has a big correction. And so that's why we get all this kind of, you know, and we're just barely going to be here. We're burning so much fuel doing this. Mm-hmm. And of course, creating all sorts of acceleration that would be not good for your equipment <laughs> no. or your people. Ah, ah, don't fall over. Ah, don't fall over. Ah, not too bad. Okay, got himself turned back around. <laughs> and that's why he's putting out 1% constantly, because he doesn't have any other way of adjusting except for that vectored uh, rocket there. Here we go. Crashing down very quickly. Coming up on the 700, uh, wherein we will start trying to safely land, and we might. And there's a little bit. There's a little bit there, and we get a little. Uh, yeah, so you know, much noisier. You know, in the in the zero noise, we didn't have any of these little spikes, early spikes. Yeah, that's a lot of spikes. Premature speculation <laughs> uh, in your thrust. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> oh, there he goes. Uh, not too bad. Huh? Not too, you know. Yeah. Not an efficient bonk, bonk. use of fuel. No. But not noisy enough to cause it to completely fail like we did on the last one. The fail the... So that was pretty much what I was trying to get across. And they say the that uh, brevity is the soul of wit. And ideally, if you know a subject, you can explain it much more briefly. Uh, uh, if you no. have the way of visualizing what you're trying to get across. <laughs> so hopefully this had uh, cleared things up for uh, everyone who was a little confused by the last one. And that was pretty much uh, all we had for today. Awesome. We're going to keep it short and Great. sweet. So thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, uh, be sure to follow us and link us and like us and all the various social media can ways of connecting 
And if you really like to see more of this, be sure to support us on Patreon. We've got two simple tiers, $3 for the everyday viewer, $10 if you really want to help us out. We've got some bump, uh, stickers and buttons to give away. And any of that kind of support will really help in keeping us going. So we'll see you next time. And hopefully you uh, like this sort of briefer, more... Um, put together format. <laughs> yeah, very Bye. informative. Bye. Take it, take it. Button. Yeah.